Hey everybody, it's Doug. You've heard me talk about all the reasons why I love Cleverhood, especially for when I'm walking and biking around my neighborhood. But one thing I haven't mentioned is that Cleverhood makes great rain gear for traveling. If you need something that takes up almost zero space in your checked luggage or your carry-on, the Rover Rain Cape has you covered. It's perfect for hikes through nature since it goes over you and your backpack. If you need something even more stylish for pleasant strolls through your favorite European city, I'm a big fan of the Urbanaut Trench. Listeners of The War on Cars can receive 15% off the Rover Rain Cape, the Urbanaut Trench, and everything in the Cleverhood store now through the end of September. Just go to cleverhood.com slash waroncars and enter code RAINFALL at checkout. Stay dry and stay stylish wherever your travels take you with Cleverhood. This is The War on Cars. I am Doug Gordon, and I am sitting here with my co-hosts, Sarah Goodyear and Aaron Napperstack. Hey there. What's up? Uh, Not sure if you've both heard, but there's an election coming up. Have you heard about this? Sadly, I have. You have. Are you you hiding your heads under the covers, or are you paying attention? I'm paying attention. I was hiding my head under the covers. I really couldn't stand paying attention to it until we had a switch of candidates in the Democratic Party. Now I'm, I'm a little more engaged. Yeah, it, it is feeling a little bit more hopeful. Hope is a feeling we have not felt in quite a long time. So that's where I am. I'm going to sit with the hope and turn it into action and volunteer and let's get Harris elected. One of the things that has been a big issue this campaign season has been Project 2025. What do both of you know about Project 2025? Well, I recently downloaded the Project 2025 Mandate for Leadership, and I know that it's 922 pages long on my computer. So it's, it's, a, it's a quite detailed policy manifesto. Sarah, what do you know? I know that this is basically a blueprint for dismantling the United States government as we know it. Right. So Project 2025, it's also known as the Presidential Transition Project, It's an initiative by the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative think tank, to prepare for a potential second Trump administration. Now, some of that is coming from, you know, hiring people who will staff up this administration. But the mandate for leadership is the document that lays out the policy agenda for this Trump administration that might be coming. We don't know. It was all over the news this summer, most notably when Michigan State Senator Mallory McMorrow held up a really big copy of the document in book form at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago in August. They went ahead and wrote down all the extreme things that Donald Trump wants to do in the next four years. We read it. And whatever you think it might be, it is so much worse. There was also what I thought a very funny and effective bit from Kenan Thompson, the SNL star. You ever seen a document that could kill a small animal and democracy at the same time? (laughs) Here it is. You know how when you download an app and there are hundreds of pages there that you don't read, it's just the terms and conditions? and you just click agree, right? Well, these are the terms and conditions of a second Trump presidency. You vote for him, you vote for all of this. Let's take a look. So understandably, a lot of the conversation around Project 2025 has been about the stakes for abortion access or LGBTQ plus rights, protections for civil servants, the status of programs such as social security, Medicare, and Medicaid, the future of things like the Department of Education, the EPA, a whole lot more. But there's also a chapter about the Department of Transportation. It's just 10 pages out of this massive document. But if the policy ideas in it are realized, it could spell doom for a lot of the progressive transportation policies that we like, as well as the country's ability to fight climate change. With us to break it all down is Kevin DeGood, 
who is the Director of Infrastructure Policy at the Center for American Progress. Kevin DeGood, welcome to The War on Cars. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So, Kevin, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what you do at the Center for American Progress. So at CAP, my main responsibility is analyzing different pieces of federal legislation that intersect with transportation, cities, and housing. So a lot of it's about figuring out how the federal government is spending money and how it could do a better job delivering inclusive economic growth and affordable mobility to American households. Let's get right into things. There's been a lot of talk about the contents of Project 2025, and rightfully so. There hasn't necessarily been that much about who wrote each chapter, because every person who wrote a chapter in Project 2025 could potentially become a cabinet secretary or a high-level official in a second Trump administration. And the chapter on transportation is written by a woman named Diana Furtgut Roth, She's an economist at the Heritage Foundation. She worked in the first Trump administration at USDOT. She also worked under Reagan, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush. Her conservative bona fides are are very real. Kevin, what's your sort of top line review of this chapter that she wrote? When I look at this chapter, I see something that is extreme and would result in you know, huge disruptions to how we build and deliver transportation projects. But it's also a vision of the future that is one that I don't think really lines up with what most Americans want. I mean, first and foremost, it's a vision that is intensely focused around cars and driving and sees a future where there is little, if any, public transportation as we know it. In fact, two of the ideas that are centerpieces of this chapter are one, to eliminate all federal formula funds for public transportation, and two, to eliminate the major grant program that provides money that allows transit authorities to expand and improve the systems that they have. So right off the bat, we know that this is a huge change and a rather extreme one that I don't think most Americans would agree with. Can I tell you guys something kind of funny about about this? So in preparing for this episode, I was looking up Diana Furcutt Roth to try to find out as much about her as I possibly could. And as I was doing the research, I was like, you know, gosh, she sounds really familiar. Mm. And I am not so much of a nerd that I could tell you who like, you know, Republican administration members are beyond like the vice president and maybe the secretary of state. I'm like, God, her name sounds really familiar. And then as I was doing research, I found this article in Forbes.com that Uh she wrote opposing bike lanes in Washington, D.C. She also wrote another article opposing bike lanes in Petaluma, California, which I guess must be where she lives when she's not in D.C. I think this gives some context to the kind of arguments we're going to be hearing that Kevin is going to describe in this chapter. The article in Forbes is titled, Bike Lanes Don't Make Cycling Safe. Right, (laughs) right. Uh, Right, yeah. And it starts off with a sort of classic bike lash Everyone favors cycling, but bike lanes are not safe. Like some of my best friends are bike lanes, right? Um, And I don't know, Kevin, if you remember, there was this woman, Sarah Langenkamp, who worked Mm. for the State Department. She was killed riding her bicycle in D.C. And it was really tragic. Her husband, I think, also worked for the State Department. And he got very vocal about bike safety. And there was a big push after her death to really step things up in D.C. And so Diana wrote this article In fact, quoting people like John Forrester, whom we debunked thoroughly in our John Forrester episode, about all the ways in which protected bicycle lanes do not make cyclists safe. So that's kind of who we're dealing with here. It's kind of perfect. It's like the local anti-bike lane crank will be running the entire U.S. Department of Transportation under the next Trump administration if that happens. So. Yeah. I think when Governor Hochul paused the uh, congestion pricing, she said that was a win for climate, too. So. Great. So, so we're, <laughs> so both we're really sides. Yeah. getting, yeah, getting a nice, good, good <laughs> picture good. of her worldview there. All right. Well, but I do think that's good context because Kevin, you mentioned that like, you know, they're the facts that she is using to uh, underpin her arguments such that they, that they are in this chapter are not so great. So could we go through a little bit about what she is talking about? Let, let's start at the very top. I wonder if one of you can read the first line of this chapter on transportation. 
America needs transportation that is more abundant and affordable, as well as dignified, accessible, and family-friendly. Yeah, well, what's wrong with that? Who could argue with that? Kevin, what do you think? What strikes me about this is that later on in the chapter, she calls for the total elimination of all federal funding for public transportation. And I can't help but think that she thinks that public transportation is both undignified and not family friendly. Of course, we know that that's not true, but right off the bat, you're hit in the face with something that is pretty resoundingly classist. And I think that it's good to keep that in mind as we talk about the rest of the chapter. Yeah, this reminds me of something I was thinking about when I was sitting on the subway yesterday looking at this mother with her two kids. They got on the train. She folded up the stroller. They were playing a game together, the three of them. And they were just having such a great time. And I was thinking how often you hear, like, if you have kids, you have to have a car. And this idea that one can't have children in a dignified way without a car is something that is just hammered home all the time. And yet, if you ride public transportation, you often see scenarios like the one I saw where a family is actually getting to like hang out together and play with each other and interact instead of being strapped into the seats of their SUV. And I guess I'm very yellow-pilled by the war on cars here. Is that what we call it? If we're sure. Effectively that's propagandizing I like ourselves. I like that. But like all these adjectives to me immediately bring up better transit and biking, you know, so abundant. Oh, like high frequency buses on, in my neighborhood. That would be abundant. Affordable. Certainly cars are not affordable. <laughs> dignified sitting in traffic is not dignified, accessible. Well, we know cars are not accessible. You, you have to have a driver's license. You have to be able-bodied in five different ways. Everything about this set of adjectives to me says like, yeah, okay, great. I, I want those things. I want better transit and safer biking and a walkable neighborhood so I can have abundant, affordable, dignified, accessible, family-friendly transportation. So, okay, Heritage Foundation, what's your definition of those things? Exactly. And that that's where I would say is, as a practitioner of the white paper arts here in Washington, D.C., you got to say, these are things that everybody would agree with, right? If you're just reading that, coming to it for the first time, you think, well, who would object to any of that? But it's when you dig a little bit deeper, you see that the vision is one that is very different from the transportation system that I think we're familiar with now, but not in ways that would be either abundant or affordable. Kevin, you mentioned pretty specifically that she just gets a lot of facts wrong in this. What I think is a pretty big one that you flagged. It says, the U.S. Department of Transportation, with a requested fiscal year 2023 budget of $142 billion, was originally intended simply to provide a policy framework for transportation safety, rulemaking, and regulation. So what's wrong with that statement right there? Well, what's odd about it is it wants to take one particular moment in time and sort of freeze it in amber as though nothing could ever change about policy or, or what we decide to do as a democracy. So if we go all the way back to the origins of federal involvement in transportation, we have to go back to the Post Office Appropriations Act of 1894. And in that was $10,000 to do really just information sharing, best practices. We got to think 1894, there are no state departments of transportation. We don't have highway programs. We're just starting to see some early mechanization of wagons, right? And people are starting to talk about, well, how could we make road improvements? So the federal government starts to act as a bit of an information clearinghouse. And this role holds for a number of years. But we get our first real federal appropriations for road construction in 1913, and we're off to the races. So what we have to say is we have well over 100 years where the federal government has this grant making role where it's serving as a partner to state and local jurisdictions so that they can build the systems that they've planned. But the idea that somehow we were always meant to be just an information clearinghouse or a safety regulator is bizarre because we, we haven't been that for a very long time. But I think this is so typical of uh, some of these conservative, originalist, ideological stances, right? In that they they seem eager to 
freeze the role of the government at whatever point they think that it was appropriate and not recognize that in a democratic society, the role of government evolves. Absolutely. So what we have is a series of different authorization bills where we have made this evolution where the federal government is playing a bigger role. And this is something that we've affirmed again and again and again, Congress after Congress. We have elected folks who've come in and said, no, we're going to have the federal government play this active role, play this partnership role to try to develop a national system of transportation that you know has certain characteristics. But to try to put a pin in one thing in the late 19th century as though that were the only proper way for the federal government to interact with transportation is just bizarre. So yeah, it's this like constitutional originalist approach to transportation that makes no sense. I think one of the tricky things about this this whole issue area is that people don't really understand what the USDOT does and the fact that it, in some ways it is just like a gigantic distributor of money to state DOTs. Absolutely. So a lot of what the federal government does is just pass money down to state departments of transportation, particularly for highways. For public transportation, most of that money flows directly to the transit service providers themselves. And to put a few numbers on it, just to give us a sense of scale, if we look at the infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure law, it authorizes about $14 billion a year in transit formula grants. And so every transit service provider you can think of from MTA in New York City all the way down to smaller rural providers, they each get a check from FTA to help them cover part of their capital costs. And for smaller operators outside of uh, metro areas of 200,000, they can use some of that money to cover operations as well. But this is the federal government acting as a partner, providing some base capital assistance. And those dollars are critical to the service that people use every day. So what does the Heritage Foundation Project 2025 Republican Party plan want to do with that money and that grant making capacity of the of the USDOT? Well, what they want to do is completely eliminate FTA, right? I mean, in theory, there could be some safety regulatory functions, but all the spending would be gone. So that $14 billion a year in formula money would just dry up or potentially be handed over to the state DOT as just a general check. And same with the capital investment grants program, which is what New York City has done for the Second Avenue subway or the Hudson River tunnels or, you know, pick your big mega transportation project, they get CIG money. So those dollars would be eliminated, which would create instantaneously a huge hole and would be fairly crippling to these operators trying to figure out how to backfill those lost dollars. But it ties into another kind of conservative obsession that also doesn't hold up to scrutiny, which is that somehow the only legitimate expenditures from Washington on transportation would be for interstate highways, coming back to this idea that only interstate commerce is a legitimate source of federal involvement. And so for folks who hold that out, transit is this great violation because you know transit is local and highways are interstate. But of course, that doesn't work either. We know, just take New York City again, every morning, millions of people get up and cross from New Jersey or from South Jersey into Philadelphia, take your pick, using public transportation. We cross state lines all the time. And of course, most vehicle trips are under nine miles in length. We're not crossing state lines when we get in our cars most days. So this dichotomy of the federal government, it's legitimate if it's interstate, but it's not legitimate if it's not, and highways interstate and transit is not, it just doesn't hold up. But the Project 2025 chapter on transportation keeps trying to push that general ideological frame. So along those lines then of money then just being handed out to states, which they would then just spend on highways, which to be fair, they mostly just do now anyway, but it'd be much worse under a Trump administration. Project 2025 does say explicitly, she writes, DOT's discretionary grant-making process should be abolished and funding should be focused on formulaic distributions to the states. So they would basically just take this big pot of money and say, Texas, you're really big. You get this amount. Yeah. You know, Rhode Island, you're very small. You get this smaller amount and good luck. And if you are a mayor in a Democratic city surrounded by a sea of red in, let's say, Nebraska, you would get nothing. Right. And that's where this idea of a federal local partnership becomes so important. So 
if you have ideas about how to have a more inclusive and balanced and sustainable transportation system in your city or in your metro area, but you have a state legislature that might not be on board with that project, there is this possibility with federal discretionary dollars to sort of go around your state DOT and try to have this federal local partnership. But it's also a vision of, you know, we want cities to experiment. We want different ideas. We want people to try different things. And DOTs can be a little monolithic, right? And they have an approach. They mostly build highways. They mostly repair the systems that we have. These are not organizations that are always the most dynamic. And so cutting off federal discretionary grant programs and just turning them into one big kind of block grant to a state DOT makes it that much harder for people to try to be experimental and entrepreneurial and try new approaches. And so again, having those federal grants is great because it allows mayors and city and county officials to just try different stuff, take a run at it. And, you know, it's it's interesting how these ideas get hidden in this very wonky bureaucratic language, mm-hmm. you know, so we should explain like discretionary grant making processes. I mean, that's, I assume, Kevin, that's an attack on things like the Tiger Grant program that emerged in around 2012 in the Obama administration. Tiger Grants were a way for, I guess, progressives in the Obama USDOT to skirt some of these traditional funding mechanisms that just dumped money into state DOT highway projects, Tiger Grants allowed all of these small cities to launch new transit services. So when they're talking about getting rid of discretionary grant making processes, I assume this is very specifically what they want to get rid of. They want to get rid of things like Tiger Grants. Absolutely. So the infrastructure law introduced several new competitive discretionary grant programs, meaning you know, a state DOT, a city, a county, a transit authority, whatever, can put together a grant application and go after money like for Tiger, which now we call RAISE. And there's a whole bunch of others, right? Reconnecting Communities is an excellent new grant program. We have Safe and Complete Streets. There's a whole bunch of different money in the infrastructure bill that is competitive. And what it allows you to do is reward the best ideas and reward the best projects. But it does mean that those dollars are not flowing into formula programs that are controlled by state DOT budgets. And that is, of course, inherently political, right? There is a tension there about who's the primary mover, whose projects are being funded. And this chapter in Project 2025 is an attack on that federal local partnership idea. And it wants to plow all the money basically as one big block grant to state DOTs. But that's not where the sort of ideological differences stop. Another huge change is this chapter pushes hard on the idea of private financing of public infrastructure. And it pushes hard on the idea of ride hailing and private providers, pay per ride type services, as opposed to the system that we have now, which is mostly private automobiles being driven by individuals, right? So there's a much deeper conservative vision for financing and how the system would operate as well. Yeah, I noticed that they did a really interesting thing in this chapter, that she basically defines public transportation as anything a member of the public can use to transport themselves. We define public transportation as things like a bus or a train. She defines it as a ride-hailing vehicle that any person can summon on their phone and hop into from the curb. Yeah, absolutely. And then... In addition to that, there is a this push for public-private partnerships. And, you know, it helps if we step back and think about exactly what those are and how they're different from the way we go about financing infrastructure today to understand what some of the shortcomings of that approach are. Most of what we build is actually fairly low dollar. If you go in onto a state DOT website and pull up their five-year transportation improvement program, and open up that Excel, what you're going to see are thousands of lines for thousands of projects that are usually just a couple million dollars. You know, a lot of what we build, a lot of what state DOTs do every year isn't the big stuff that gets written up in newspaper articles. It's just the sort of blocking and tackling of everyday system maintenance and expansion one little project at a time. And we do that with grant dollars, right? It's the formula funds from USDOT, It's the gas tax revenues that states collect. They do that with grant dollars, pay as you go. 
And then in addition, there's often some public sector bonding, right? These are municipal bonds, they're tax exempt. And it's that combination of grant dollars and municipal bonds is how we finance these programs. On a public-private partnership, you have this, usually an individual project, it's usually quite large, either hundreds of millions of dollars or maybe even multiple billions of dollars. And the financing of it is going to be a combination of those traditional grant dollars, some private equity, and then on top of that, some private bonding, private activity bonds. Without going too far down that road, it's important to understand that public-private partnerships really only work on these mega projects. It's a very, very small percentage of what state DOTs do, and it's not a substitute for just general revenue raising and general grant dollars and public bonding. But there's this real intense focus on it inside of this chapter, and it's because those mega projects are associated with user fees. So if you have a toll highway, that opens up the possibility of doing a public-private partnership And that is, again, a big focus of this chapter is trying to move towards more private financing of public infrastructure. I was just thinking about how this mirrors so many other what I see as hypocritical positions that conservatives and the Republican Party routinely take about local control. You know, they say that they're interested in local control. And yet when it comes to something like these grants where local communities can say, this is what we need on a really granular level, and we're going to tell you about it and get money for that from the federal government, that that's something that Republicans are opposed to, but they are in favor of local control when it serves their purposes or they're willing to privatize things and really take them completely out of any sort of democratically elected mechanism if that benefits the people that they want to benefit. And, you know, Sarah, just to just to add to that, I was also struck by the way in which, you know, to get back to the, the discretionary grant making programs, Kevin reminded me that those are all competitive grant making programs. Like a bunch of cities have to put their ideas on the table and then the U.S. DOT is like, well, hey, that Tucson light rail program, that's that's going to be a very effective program. Let's fund that. So it's like, again, it's this weird flipping of supposedly conservative ideology is like, we like competition. Right. We want the best ideas to win. But actually, it's like the conservatives are being the communists here. They're just like, <laughs> we want the money to be distributed in giant block grants. We don't want any competition. Just pour the money into the highways. So it is this really interesting, like, ideological flip, I think. Yeah. The things that came to mind when you were speaking, and I I saw these mayors speak on what the Biden administration's transportation department has meant for them. And one was the mayor of Lincoln, Nebraska, Mayor Baird. And she is a Democrat in a red state. And her city got a new multimodal center, basically a big bus station and all kinds of new transportation improvements around it. And one of the things that she was highlighting was that it had new and improved bathrooms and other rest facilities for the drivers. Um, And I just thought, you know, in a new Trump administration, that kind of, like you said, granular level idea would just never come to fruition. Aaron, you mentioned Arizona. John Giles, the Republican mayor of Mesa, Arizona, made a big splash at some Harris Walls rallies where he is not going to vote for Trump and is appearing at these rallies for the Democrat. It was great. Let's play the clip. As you may know, I'm a lifelong Republican. I have to tell you that I I do not recognize my party. The Republican Party has been taken over by extremists that are committed to forcing people in the center of the political spectrum out of the party. So I have something to say to those of us who are in the political middle. You don't owe a damn thing to that political party. He was able to secure $12 million in grant money from USDOT to build up its public EV charging network and then another $16 million in federal grant money to move forward with a streetcar extension. So even when you have Republicans who want to do good things for their cities, that could all go away in the next administration. Yeah, those are great examples. And I think it's also worth remembering that there are 
dozens of states where there's either state law on the books or state constitutional provisions that prohibit the spending of any state gas tax revenues or other vehicle fees on projects other than highways. So again, you can really be hamstrung and it's those federal dollars that make alternatives possible. It's the classic socialism is only good when it's for cars and trucks. (laughs) Pretty much, pretty much. Kevin, you know, I think we're talking about sort of projects that you can see and and feel and use, you know, a light rail extension, an EV charger, but USDOT does a lot of stuff that's not all that sexy and therefore is not that attractive to private equity, let's say. It's not a ride hail service that will enrich investors. It's not some project that's going to return billions of dollars like a private toll on a highway. Can we talk a little bit about the stuff that might just stop being funded if the Republicans have their way? Well, this is where we come back to, you know, the infrastructure bill is going to expire during the next presidential administration, right? Congress is going to have to take up these programs and figure out what they want to reauthorize and continue and and what they might want to kill off. So what is on the table here, the stakes are the charging money, the reconnecting communities money to try to deal with some of the scars from that initial interstate construction era where we chopped up cities and we broke neighborhoods apart and we created barriers to opportunity. If we think about all the focus on trying to build infrastructure that is accessible for everybody, not just people in cars, right? There are dozens of different programs that Congress is going to have to decide whether or not they keep them. And that's what's on the table. And so I think if we if we think about Project 2025 and this extreme I don't even know if it's conservative vision that it's putting forward versus what is in the infrastructure bill now. There's a huge disconnect. And I think many of the programs that people are the most excited about would be the first ones on the chopping block. One of the things that also concerns me about the discourse that is generated by Project 2025 in this case is the way that it is moving the Overton window on the entire transportation discussion. So, for instance, Kamala Harris has been asked at this point in the campaign, you know, are you going to stick with the EV mandate that the Biden administration had gotten behind? And it's, you know, she's waffling. Her her campaign won't really commit. And so I was wondering if maybe you could talk about how damaging having this kind of proposal so far over in one direction is to whatever happens in the future, regardless of who wins this election. One of the central elements of the chapter is this attack on vehicle efficiency standards, which we call CAFE. It's corporate average fuel economy. So the Biden administration put forward a very aggressive CAFE standard and This piece attacks that and just says, this isn't beneficial. The math behind it was all wrong. This is raising the cost of vehicles, which is making transportation more costly for households. And of course, in actuality, because the cost of fuel is such a large part of owning and operating a vehicle, having more efficient cars actually saves households money in the long run, not to mention all the benefits around air quality and reducing pollution in metropolitan areas, right? So we can see in this document, this full attack on anything that would improve vehicles, whether that's pure EVs, whether that's CAFE standards for internal combustion engine vehicles, transit money. It is a vision for the future, which is dominated by driving that is unconstrained in any way. Kevin, could you talk specifically about how a second Trump administration would approach what California is doing? Because they have some of the most aggressive plans to phase out internal combustion engines. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. You know, California has a special waiver under the Clean Air Act to set more aggressive targets around vehicle emissions. And there are, I think, more than a dozen other states that also follow California's lead in that regard. And in the previous Trump administration, they tried to withdraw California's waiver to try to create a uniform standard nationally. Of course, that standard would have been weaker when it comes to vehicle emissions. So again, I think We can look at that and extrapolate forward and think that they would probably try to push that same repeal again in a second administration. I wanted to read one part of this document because it gets right at the heart of a lot of stuff we talk about on the podcast. The chapter on transportation, there's a little paragraph that says, 
in pursuit of an anti-fossil fuel climate agenda never approved by Congress, the Biden administration has raised fuel economy requirements to levels that cannot be realistically met by most categories of ICE vehicles. The purpose is to force the auto industry to transition away from traditional technologies to the production of electric vehicles and compel compel Americans to accept costly EVs despite a clear and persistent consumer preference for ICE-powered vehicles. Aaron is laughing. I was (laughs) laughing when I read that. Kevin, you and I had talked about this. We have had Peter Norton, the historian, on the show. And that idea that Americans have a preference for gas cars when up until recently gas-powered cars were the only thing that you could purchase is just... As absurd to me as saying, you know, McDonald's customers have a preference for Big Macs and never get a salad. Well, yeah, because the only thing you can get at McDonald's is some variation of a hamburger. There are echoes in here also of what the Supreme Court is doing, that like these regulations and these uh, fuel efficiency standards and the regulation of even how much carbon we're emitting into the atmosphere has never been approved by Congress. It's just not part of their job. And so we're going to get rid of it, basically. It's so odd to try to claim what the standard preference is when most people don't have any other option but to drive and don't have any other option but to drive, at least historically, an internal combustion engine car, right? And so to try to claim that forever and all times, that's what the American consumer preference is to me, it just seems odd. And you're right, Peter Norton has done an absolutely brilliant job of discussing the flaws in that logic in a lot of his books. It's again, it's like they're trying to claim the mantle of You know, we're the ones who are offering choice and freedom and the best ideas in the marketplace win. And it's it's exactly the opposite of what they're doing. Right. And you talked earlier about the idea of mobility as a service and this issue of preference comes up when they discuss that, where they say increasing private sector financing could revolutionize travel and increase everyday mobility to its greatest potential in a way that Americans prefer. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the idea of mobility as a service and why that is something that figures in this chapter. Well, obviously there's a huge industry there that would like to see mobility as a service expanded and this chapter definitely carries the water for it. We see mobility as a service, we see ride hailing, it it exists in pretty much everywhere in the country now. And it is certainly an option that is nice to have. But if we think about it at a larger scale, what a lot of the research shows is that it would actually worsen congestion and worsen metropolitan air pollution. And the reason for that is cars mostly sit. You studies show that cars sit unused 96, 97% of the time. And when you have lots of vehicles circulating, looking for the next ride, either repositioning to areas of frequent demand or going back out deadheading to pick somebody up a few miles away, what you end up with is actually a lot, lot, lot more VMT than you have under a non-ride hailing mobility as a service model. And this is true whether or not we're talking about cars being driven by human drivers or we're talking about the increasing presence of automated vehicles, particularly in California and Arizona, right? Those vehicles, when they're deadheading, it's the same effect. You have extra miles that are being traveled, even though nobody's being carried, and it adds up quickly. So at a low level of use, it doesn't particularly seem like a problem. But if we start to think about it at scale, then it has real challenges for the system. So, Kevin, we've been talking about a kind of nightmare scenario for transportation under Project 2025 and this policy wish list that they've come up with. Let's imagine a different scenario where, you know, we sort of get more of what we've been getting. Like, what's what's the positive outlook depending on the outcome of this election? I think the positive outlook is that progressives look at the combination of domestic investment legislation. So that's the infrastructure bill, that's the Inflation Reduction Act, and that we should also probably include chips and science in there. But they're looking at those bills saying, well, what didn't we get the first time around? What were some of the items on our wish list around improving affordable access, expanding public transportation, 
expanding passenger rail, electrifying passenger rail corridors, right? Thinking about ways that we might try and structure federal highway programs so that we have more of a focus on asset repair and less of a focus on expansion, right? How could we be more aggressive around metropolitan air quality, right? So I think it's what didn't we get the first time? Let's try to fill those gaps when we get a chance in the next four years. You know, I think really the lesson from all of this is, you know, I'm an enthusiastic Harris supporter. I think she'll be an excellent president. But I also subscribe to the idea that voting is a little bit like picking your opponent. And you can have one opponent who wants to just burn everything down and you're going to spend the next four years putting out fires. Or you can have an opponent who more or less wants to keep the house in the shape that it's in, renovate the bathroom, put in a new air conditioning system. And maybe it's not everything you'd like to see happen to the house, but you can say, hey, shouldn't we also uh, fix the garage door too? Shouldn't we also do these other things? And the latter is much more preferable to have. Yeah. And and the USDOT is one of those areas where, you know, regular Americans don't really see what's happening there. It's just, it's a very big, opaque, bureaucratic entity. But the political choices we make really matter in terms of how that gigantic aircraft carrier of an agency is directed. It'll make a big difference depending on who's elected. Kevin, do you have any final thoughts? One of the things that gets lost when we think about traditional ways of paying for infrastructure versus private financing is that there really is a geographic difference in this. If we look at where public-private partnerships tend to be located, they tend to be located in the biggest metropolitan regions. And it's not a financing model that is particularly useful for smaller communities in rural areas. There have been occasions when P3 deals have done some bridge work in rural areas, but it's mostly an urban phenomenon and it's mostly an urban highway phenomenon. And so when you look at this chapter in Project 2025, what you should see is that it's not one that's going to deliver benefits to rural Americans. And it's not one that's particularly going to deliver benefits to communities that are already economically behind, right? Public-private partnerships tend to be in those places that are growing rapidly and where somebody can, you know, on the 30th floor of a tower doing finance work in lower Manhattan can plot out on a spreadsheet what future travel demand might be, what future toll payments might be. And that might work if you have a place that's growing and is dynamic, but it's much less likely to work out if you're a region that's struggling economically. So carrying the water for private financing is really carrying the water for geographic inequity. Again, just reflecting that the stated values of the Republican Party, they bend over backwards all the time to say they're the party of the rural voter, they're the party of the non-urban elite. It's once again giving the lie to that. Well, Kevin DeGood, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for joining the War on Cars to help us break down all the stakes for this election coming up soon. We really appreciate having you on. Thank you so much. Glad I could do it. So that's it for this episode of The War on Cars. Once again, we want to thank Kevin DeGood for joining us. We also want to remind you to vote. A good idea is to make a plan to vote. Talk to friends and families. Encourage them to make a plan too. It's really one of the most effective ways you can get people to actually go out and vote. Depending on where you live, you can vote early, you can vote by mail, you can vote in person. Election day is Tuesday, November 5th. Find out more and check your voter registration by going to vote.org. If you like what we do on the podcast, please support us on Patreon. You can go to thewaroncars.org, click support us, and pitch in starting at just $3 a month. We'll send you stickers and you'll get discounts on merchandise and access to dozens of bonus episodes. We want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, including our top supporters, Charlie G of Human Powered Law in Portland, Oregon, Virginia Baker, Mark Headland, and the Parking Reform Network. Thanks also to the Helen and William Mazur Foundation. A big thanks to Cleverhood for their continued support. For 15% off the best rain gear for walking or biking, including the Rover Rain Cape and the official War on Cars Anorak, go to cleverhood.com slash war on cars and enter code rainfall at checkout.
This episode was recorded by Josh Wilcox at the Brooklyn Podcasting Studio. It was edited by Ali Lemer. Our theme music is by Nathaniel Goodyear. Our transcriptions are done by Russell Gregg. I'm Aaron Napperstack. I'm Sarah Goodyear. I'm Doug Gordon. And this is The War on Cars. 